There's a lot going on, and I want to I want to work through something here today. It's probably going to be the start of a, a couple of messages, uh, but I have a bit of a different message for you today. We are in the world, not of the world. Amen. Amen. And sometimes it takes uh, a while for us to figure out what that means. As believers, we are sometimes um, on a journey of getting out on a journey of, of getting out of where we were and to where we're uh, needing to be. But I'm going to talk about some things this morning that I, I really don't normally talk about very often. But I'm going to aim at some politics, some social things, media, worldview, things like that. At the end of the service, uh, we're going to have communion together too. So if you haven't gotten your communion, maybe we... Um, we could do that right now, and, and while, while I'm beginning, just raise your hand if you didn't get a communion cup as you came in. So while I start, let's just do that so that we don't have to take the time to do that here in a little bit. But this is the world we live in. This is our world. Can't help it. This is where you are. This is the time you were born. This is your world. And one of the things that I want to aim at and encourage is that we seek more discernment but not only that, but we also seek to have a better response in the world. And so if you've got a sermon journal, if you're taking notes or anything today, if something pokes at you, I'd write it down. Make sure that you write it down. And also I just want to say too, ever, if you have any questions about anything that's said, please don't hesitate to reach out. Don't hesitate to ask because it's my desire to be clear I don't want to be confusing about anything, but I do want to say this. I want to be clear about something first, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is our focus. That's our aim. And I want you to, to think right now, center your life and your thoughts on Jesus. And, and this is what we did in worship, singing holy. He is holy. Center your thoughts on that right now. And I want to say this, your favorite superhero is not Lord. Your political party, your favorite political figure, not Lord. Your celebrity crush, not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is God. He is your God. He is my God. And He is a God that will not be mocked. Do you understand that? God will not be mocked. The God that will not be overcome. He will not be overruled. He will not be ousted ever. And I say these things because, remember the word I used before, absolute? These things are absolute. These things will not change. And so I'm going to put them up against some other things like uh, today here, you'll see. But in Jesus, we have unity. Jesus will not share His glory with another. Be clear on that. And when the Father says so, guess what? He's coming back. He's coming again. We will never find perfect unity in anything or anyone but Jesus. Amen? There will come a day, and again, I'm dealing with absolutes here, that every knee will bow before Him, and that means every Democrat, every Republican, every mocker, every scoffer will bow at the feet of Jesus. Do you understand that? And I want you to be careful, too, uh, as you listen to this, that you don't say, say things under your breath, uh, that you don't find yourself judging. You might, you might hear something that I'm saying and go, oh, yeah, amen to that. You know, just, I, I want you to listen. There might be something that you'll say amen to, but I want you to be clear. This isn't a political message. It's still spiritual, okay? I want you to see that. Rather, I want you to find yourself evaluating and improving you, not hoping somebody else gets something that you think you already know. Does that make sense? So I want to start with Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. It just says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. 
He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. I try to be careful when, when I talk about politics and certain hot-button social topics. I'm going to tell you why. Because the Spirit needs to lead us, not emotion. You hear that? The Spirit of God needs to lead us, not emotion. Very important that we understand that. We don't need to get caught up in something simply because the mainstream media or social media, a political figure, or a celebrity has put it in our face or in our lap. Did you hear that? I'm going to say it again. We do not need to get caught up in something simply because the media, mainstream or social media, a political figure or party or a celebrity has put that in your face or in your lap. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. But that to me is drama. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some stuff that, that I, I'm... I want us to grow. I want us to see things more clearly. I want us to be discerning. But I prefer to build faith. I would choose faith over fiction, over fantasy, and over fad any day. I choose faith over fiction, fantasy, or fad any day. Okay? And sometimes that we need to see that when the media speaks, it's just bait to get us caught up in a distraction. And how often do we take the bait and get distracted? It creates controversy. It can create division. And I'm just going to say this. I really don't care for that kind of corporate manipulation. I don't want to be manipulated like that. I don't want you to be manipulated like that. I don't want the church to be manipulated like that. Okay? It's like a conversation with someone who dictates the topic of a conversation by making something urgent or by injecting high levels of emotion into it. Has anybody ever been in the presence of somebody who's done that? All too often, right? And somebody comes, they come floating in and all of a sudden you're like, what just happened here? Because you've got all of this emotion And you've got all of this urgency and actually sometimes fear and anxiety gets brought into this. And now you're thrust into this conversation. You're thrust into this thing that just happened and you're all caught up in it. And what I choose to do is say, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to let the Spirit of God just take a second, help me breathe through this and and see what's, what's really going on here. But if you could see the entire media as a person, just personify it for a second, that that person, what are they trying to do? If the the whole media is a person, what is that person trying to do? It's trying to dictate the conversation in your life and in all of our lives. If that was a person, that is what oftentimes is happening, okay? That person is trying passionately to direct what you'll believe Or think about certain things. You see that happening? And again, I'm not directing this. You may think, some of you, oh, he's talking about those people. He's talking about those people. I might be talking about you. I'm talking about us. Okay? That's why I want you to be careful not to be too judgmental as you sit out there hearing what I'm saying. All right? But I want you to think... That person is trying to cause division between you and those around you, your neighbors, your community, and even in your family. Does anybody see this happening? I hope you do. And if you don't, I hope by the end of the message you're like, wow, that's what that is. That's what's going on. I know that I'm not taking apart a scripture verse and throwing something at you and and shaping something in you out of that. But I am doing something I think is incredibly important in the world that we live in today. I think we have to be minded right. And what I think about, and you may remember a message I talked about, uh, 1 Samuel 17, with David came to King Saul 
And he said to Saul, let the hearts of the men not fail because of him. What he was saying is, it's not heart, it's mind. The word is lev, and lev means heart, and heart means mind. Remember, I'm going to keep saying that to you, so that as you read your Bible, your Old Testament especially, this is what you think. David was saying to Saul, their thinking is wrong. And sometimes we get into the world, and if our thinking is wrong, the outcome will be wrong, or our reaction will be wrong. So the thing that I want to do, especially with those who are sitting in front of me, is say, let's get our thinking right first. Okay? Amen? If we don't, then how we respond and how we review every, uh, view everything coming at us, it could be skewed, it could be blurred, it could be wrong. So, let's, let's get our thinking right. And oftentimes, what we see or hear from that media person, and again, I'm personifying it all, it's not always the whole story. It gets presented to us like a, a whole story, but it's not always like a whole story. It's oftentimes one side of a carefully crafted narrative that you can't seem, and you can't seem, I can't seem, to get a word in edgewise, because all we are are listeners in this conversation. But I want to share some thoughts with you today, and um, uh, I hope that this resonates with you. But just a quick question. When's the last time that your favorite blogger, how many of you follow a blog? You got, you know, you follow somebody on YouTube, or you got a blog, you're like, oh, I got to see what she's saying, I got to see what they're wearing, I got to see what color paint that they got, I mean, whatever, okay? You got a favorite blogger, but when's the last time that favorite blogger or a, a radio or TV personality just showed up at your door and came right into your living room. That ever happen? I mean, they just literally, wow, what are you doing? Well, you have a seat. I mean, they just come right on into your house or they open up your car door as you're going to work and they just come and sit right down next to you. Does that ever happen? It never happens. Do you know what does happen? We turn it on. We take the switch and we turn it on. We have control over the switch. I just want you to hang on to that for a second. We're not helpless because we do have control of the switch or the remote. We, can, we turn it on, we turn it off. And, and I'm going to get more to that in just a second. That media person out there not only wants your, listen to this, attention, but wants your loyalty not only your attention and your loyalty, but sometimes it gets down the road to even wanting your obedience. And I've learned over the years to not turn pol politicians and celebrities into sur superheroes. They are not my superhero, and I don't want them to be yours. You can say this, my favorite politician is not a superhero. My favorite politician is not my savior. You can whisper that out loud if you want to. My favorite politician is not my savior. Only Jesus. And that's why I started with saying, Jesus Christ is Lord and that's it. Remember, we're in the world, not of the world. We do participate in these things, but they don't... Um, comprise of who we are. But be careful who you let mold and shape your thoughts. Be very careful who you let mold and shape your thoughts. Proverbs 4.23, I shared this last year sometime or earlier this year, but it says, above all else, guard your heart. And what's heart? Heart is lev in Hebrew. It means your, your mind. Guard your mind, guard your thoughts, guard your thinking, for everything you do flows from it. Pol political parties and media-controlled narratives are very good at doing something. I'm going to introduce a concept to you, insulating the audience. Okay? So what does that mean? What do I need, mean by insulating the audience? They're good at keeping the audience from hearing any other voice out there that may offer an opposing point of view. Have you noticed that? Do you notice how good they are at the fact that you have the clicker, you have the on-off button, and yet they have so much 
control. And what I'm saying to you, the church sitting in front of me, you take it back. You're going to take back the control. You're going to understand what's going on. What's one way that they do that? What's one way that they can insulate themselves? It's simple. Villainize the other. If you think that the, out, the other thing that's opposed to them is evil or wrong or bad in any way, they will convince you to shut that voice down. They don't want you to hear that voice, if that makes sense. And so, a way to insulate is to call something else out there evil, the opposing voice. Many years ago, and I've said this before, I was an avid talk radio listener. Every time I got in my car, I loved the morning show, I loved the drive time show. I was like getting informed, man. I had all the info. I had all the right things to say. I knew, I mean, I thought I was pretty smart because I was listening to these guys. Anybody else feel like that? I'm not alone, am I? Please tell me I'm not alone. No, it was just you, Pastor Bob. But that's what I did. I listened to the radio. I listened to it all the time. I took as much of it in as I could. And I thought, man, I need to know. And then it, what it came to be was, if I wasn't listening, I was missing something. Oh, no. Yeah. I thought I was going to be uninformed. I was going to miss what was the latest thing going on out there. And that really bothered me. You know what happened? I realized I was insulated. I was insulated in there. All I could hear was one message. Now, I'm not talking about the gospel. I'm talking about what's out there in the world, the message in the world, okay? I was getting angry. I found myself less unified with those politically opposite me. This is what happens, guys. This is what happens. I thought I was actually informed. I found out I really maybe wasn't. I was made to be fearful and I was unsettled. If I, if I was honest with myself and I came right down to it, that's what was happening to me. And that is not God. That is not the Spirit of God. That is not the Spirit of Christ in me to become fearful and unsettled. But a question that I have for you, whose audience are you in? Who has the bulk of your attention today, right now? Who has the bulk of your attention? I hope we're still in the one-year Bible. It's been a long summer, right? Stay in. If you've got pages to make up, start today. Pick it up again. If you miss a couple of weeks, if you miss a month, okay, whatever. Get 11 out of 12. That's better than it was last year, right? Stay in this thing. If you're listening carefully, what you hear are talking points that are reiterated over and over again until you believe it and you repeat it. All right? That's what happens. And I, I'm going to cut a piece out of here, and maybe I'll come back to this in a, in a future message, but I'm just going to say this. It's a mantra. And mantras are spiritual. Okay, when you hear the same thing over and over and over again, uh, I'm not going to go in. It's going to take too many minutes, but um, I want to say this. This isn't benign. This is spiritual. This is not benign what is happening to us. I want our minds to be clear for the gospel. I want our minds and our pathway to be clear for Jesus and our mission. And it doesn't matter, I'm going to say this again, if you're on the right or on the left, and there's everything in between, but believers need to be discerning in this age that we live in. Believers in Jesus need to be discerning in the age that we live in. Lord, please give us eyes to see. If anything is going to be repeated, let it be the Word of God in you. Let it be the Word that is repeated in you so that you follow that. But how often do we take the time to actually discern if what we're hearing is the truth? And how do you obtain that much-needed discernment? When you're taking all of this stuff in, there's so much that I want to say on this. I'm going to try to just, just keep it to this introductory message here. But how do we get that discernment. I think the only way to do it is that we say, I need, for me, I need a solid foundation of the Word. 
I need a solid foundation in the Word of God, in the, in the relationship that I have with Jesus. I can get that discernment when I can say, this is holy and that is not. Amen. It takes time. It takes pra uh, patience, practice. It's a process. But there are two types of doctrines that I want you to be aware of. Both of these exist in your life, okay? In the world. And you have choices to make with regard to both of them. Two types of doctrine. There are social political doctrines, which I'm just going to call social doctrines. And you have biblical doctrine. And I want you to understand and be aware of which is which. Also, I want you to be able to evaluate which of these you most adhere to right now. Okay? And I say social doctrines, plural, because there are many. Social doctrines, listen to this, tend to separate people. They don't tend to unite. Even though that's what it says, that's not what they actually do. Social doctrines tend to separate, divide. And I think that's incredibly important that we understand that, that we get caught up in this. Our society as a whole and our personal lives in particular are affected by these doctrines. So we need to know what to do. But what is the purpose of a social, political doctrine and a biblical doctrine? Here's what they do. Generally speaking, they serve to guide your morality. And so if you can understand what's coming at you from a social perspective is an influence that tries to guide your morality from a social standpoint. Does that make sense? But then we have a biblical influence that guides us in a morality according to the ways and things of God. Which is which? How do you know and how do you discern that right now what I'm feeling is the pressure of a social doctrine to get me to believe and even act on certain uh, social morality that differs from what the Bible says. And you know what? You might be unpopular. We might be unpopular. The church, a born-again believer, might be unpopular because you're going to choose to follow the morality of Scripture rather than the morality of the world. Will your morality be guided by social doctrine or by biblical doctrine? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. There's a greater message here, but I want, you to, I want you to hone in on this. It says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. And from Him... The whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I don't want to be tossed around. I don't want to be tossed back and forth. I want to have firm, solid footing. Some people have strong social doctrinal adherence and will work hard to make their biblical doctrine fit within the context or the framework of that social structure. Does that make sense? Did you hear what I said? That your social structure, your social doctrine, and the social morality that you're trying to adhere to becomes bigger and more important than the morality and the structure of Scripture. It should be the opposite. It should be the other way around. But oftentimes what we see is this compromise. Let us not compromise on this. To understand what the word is, what it says, and to realize that the more you see this, the more unpopular your position is going to be in this world. Because the world is growing in, in the adherence of people out there to the social doctrine. This is where we need to be. It's more important that your social doctrines are submission, uh, submissive to your biblical doctrine. But why is this? 
because social doctrine is likely to change over time. If you've been around a long time and you've been paying attention to what goes on in the world, you know this. Just in my lifetime, I can recall a number of issues that have shifted from one viewpoint to another and not in a small way. And some of you can, can recall some of these. In politics, they call it flip-flopping. Anybody heard that word before? Flip-flopping. And sometimes they'll say it was, it's because we've become more enlightened on an issue, and perhaps that could be so. I'm not going to say that all change is bad. Because when we change to a uh, biblical morality, I would say that's a good flip-flop, wouldn't you? But when we take things like abortion, race, religion, marriage, homosexuality, transgender, uh, you name it, you throw anything in there, okay? We need to know what does the Bible say about that, not what is the social pressure on that. That's what we need to know. Opinions change. The social weather changes. I'm just going to say the need for votes to stay in office prioritizes oftentimes what one will say on any given day. That's the truth, everybody. That's a, the truth, okay? Contrast it with this fact. God never changes. Jesus Christ will never change. There will be no flip-flop in heaven. It's not going to happen. You know what the Bible says about that? I'm going to say four, four verses right now if you want to write them down. And there are more. There's, there's several more. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means every day past, today, and every day future, Jesus is the same. Always will be the same. Okay? James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He does not change. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says, God is not human that he should even lie. He's not a human being that he should even change his mind. Not like that. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? And then finally, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, it says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Some translations say it stands forever. The Word of God, your understanding of it, and your faith in it should inform every aspect of your life. Okay? That should be something we all can amen. The Word of God should inform every aspect of our lives. Your faith should inform your politics, your parenting, and your social life. All of your opinions, everything should come from here. It should come from the Word. You have a holy God. You serve a holy God. You love a holy God. Let us come closer to His holiness rather than the world's version of morality. Folks, there's a lot of destruction out there. I think we, we have... Uh, uh, an obligation to run into the harvest, but we don't have to participate in everything that's going on out there. Amen? Pop culture. Well, let me say this. That, that society, the, what, what some would call the talking heads, it's your, your news people, the people that you see on TV, any media, movies, celebrities, no matter how popular. This is a hard thing sometimes to, to go, oh my goodness, to wrap your head around. But no matter how popular or influential, should never dictate, direct, or define your faith. Unless they are in full agreement with this. And some are, okay? Nobody out there should Dictate, direct, or define your faith in Jesus Christ. Pop culture, called popular culture, has a tremendous amount of power in America. Tremendous amount of influence. It influences the clothes you wear, 
the words you use, what should be important to you, what to think, what to eat, where to go. The list goes on and on and on. That's why I would rather focus on faith than fiction, fantasy, or fad. Far more important. And again, I'm not saying that every single one of these things is bad, but I am saying, are you discerning to know what is bad in there, okay? I'm just saying, know what it is. But do you realize that American pop culture has influence all over the world and has reached so many places, in, I mean, literally, all over the world. Ephesians chapter 5, 6 through 10. It says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Don't participate. For you were once darkness, but now you are light. In the Lord, live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord. We are often very concerned about what pleases the culture around us and less about what pleases God. Let us find out what pleases the Lord. So a question, does Jesus have more influence in your life than pop culture does? When I was in youth ministry for many years, uh, I did a thing, it was, it was one Saturday a month, it was a late night candlelight worship service. We had kids, uh, it was so cool, but, but sometimes I would have 50, even 60 teenagers coming to church from, from uh, like 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, a couple hours to spend together. We would get up on the altar, we would have candles everywhere, and we would just sing and pray, and worship, and, and just be together. It was incredible. It was beautiful. We called it Starlit Garden. Uh, it, it was wonderful. It was in uh, uh, the starlight, candlelight, and in the garden because uh, we came together to grow. It was beautiful. And uh, this was back in the, and I can't even believe, that it, the mid-late uh, 1990s. Uh, some of you are like, I wasn't even born then. But um, in the early 2000s, but like I said, we would have a, a whole bunch of kids. And it was wonderful, beautiful, spiritual. I loved it. I loved being there. Um, they were growing. It was amazing. And I was always so encouraged. I was proud of them. But But the thing that discouraged me oftentimes is we would have this beautiful time of worship. We would have this beautiful time together, even tears and and, uh, things were just happening there. And then on Sunday morning, I'd find out they all got together at so-and-so's house and went and watched a horror movie. I'm like, you guys, what are we doing? You know, and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, those kids. Do you know what? We do that. We do the same thing. We might leave a beautiful service. We might leave a great conference. We might leave a Sunday morning and we just go out and we do the equivalent sometimes. And I'm just saying, that's the pull of a culture, of a world on us out there. Can we see this? I want you to be able to say this. My goal is to grow in my faith in Jesus. I need more of Him and less of the world. The source of my faith is the Word of God. Amen? We're in a time, friends, that we need to be careful. We need to be more discerning. We need to understand the world we live in and our role in it. In James 1.5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So a couple of things, and we're going to wrap up here and, and, and take communion. If you can, turn off the radio or listen less. I mean, literally, if it's consuming you like it concerned me, consumed me, I had to turn it off. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm better for it. I'm okay. I'm not missing anything, really. If something really big is happening, somebody tells me. And they'll tell you too. Watch less network news. I don't care which side you listen to. It doesn't matter. Just watch less of it. Or turn it off. You're in control of the clicker. Watch fewer movies. And if you're going to watch a movie, be selective about the movies you do watch. And you're like, 
Like, oh, oh my gosh, life's going to be so boring if I don't get to do all those things, right? <laughs> no, actually no. The people that I know who are tied into Jesus, I don't, I don't think they think they're missing anything. Amen. Amen? When you get your life wrapped up in the Lord and the mission that He has for you, I'm telling you what, you don't feel like, oh, I'm missing everything going on in the world. The world and the things of this world are passing away. Guys, get on with the stuff that's going to last forever. When you've tasted the goodness and the beauty of the Lord in a way that you never have, you'll agree with me all day long. You're not missing anything. I normally wouldn't endorse a movie from the pulpit, um, but I'm going I'm to encourage you to go see The Sound of Freedom. The tagline for the movie is that God's children are not for sale. We just prayed. We prayed for Callie. Pray for Callie, okay? I know that that movie only tells a part of the story. It's only a bit of it. There's a lot more to say in that discussion, okay? But the thing that I like about it, it gets the discussion started anyway. It's important, all right? There are many other facets to trafficking and what all of that is. And, and that just even only highlights one way that it's done and who it's done with, all right? But it gets it started. Almost equally alarming as the content of the, the movie and how, is how hard so many are working at keeping you from seeing it. I don't know if you know that that's happening. There is a great effort out there to keep those words, that movie, that message from even getting out there. Okay? Friends, that's the person I was telling you about. Wants to dictate the conversation. And here some are saying, no, you can't dictate all the conversation. We're going to start a conversation about this too. And the person out there doesn't like that. Are you following me? We tend to fear the one who is loud and seemingly powerful, but we have nothing to fear, period. I want you to grab a hold of that. We have nothing to fear, period. Several years ago, I saw a vision of a rope, one that would be used for a tug-of-war. Probably all of you have seen a tug-of-war, right? You got a bunch of people on this side, a bunch of people on this side, maybe a pit of mud in the middle, whatever, and they're pulling on each other, and I saw this as a vision on either side, people uh, who were opposed to one another for one reason or another, okay? And it was their job, uh, what was standing off to the side, what was another group of people. They were in the middle, and it was their job to keep these people opposed to each other. That was their job. Keep these people opposed to each other. Because as long as they're opposed to each other, the rope's going to stay tight, and they're going to fight. Is that, you following me? Yes. And then I saw, what if we all just let the rope go? Folks, I want you to let the rope go. I want you to let the rope go. And someone told me yesterday in a conversation, it's kind of like uh, entertainment wrestling, professional wrestling. They all work for the same company. You ever think that? Put down the rope, stop tuning in, turn off the radio and the TV, Stop watching the wrestling match. Let's get back to the gospel, friends. Let's stay with the gospel. For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you. Let's take communion together. Let's just remember Jesus now. At the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. You can open up the side with the, the wafer, the cracker there. This is where our focus should be, friends. This is where our focus should be. Jesus, may we have discernment. When the world tries to obscure you, Holy Spirit, would you help us to see even more clearly? And on this day, right now, we give you thanks and we remember you. Let's take together.
And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you carefully peel that back? Jesus, again, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We know that you came fully God and fully man. You endured a great deal of pain for me. And with this, we remember you and give you thanks. Let's take together. I'm going to share more on this message and take it a little bit farther. We'll do that in coming weeks. Right now, would you stand? If you've got kids that you need to go pick up, uh, you're welcome to run up and grab them and come back down here. If you want to spend some time in prayer, you need more ministry. Following the service here, I'm going to meet and be out in the hallway. If you're new here today, I would love to meet you. I'd love to just greet you out there. But Father God, we give you thanks today for who you are. All we want, Lord, is you. All we want is the truth. All we need is you. We don't need much else. But help us to be discerning in this world that we live in. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.